Good morning. Friends, if we haven't met before, my name is Nathan Lonsdale Bledsoe. I'm the senior pastor here at St. Stephen's. It is wonderful to be in worship with each and every one of you this beautiful morning on this 4th of July weekend. I hope that people have fun celebrations planned for tomorrow to uh, celebrate the birthday of this nation, and we'll take some time to reflect on uh, what that means to them and why it's important, and to eat some really good food, too. Uh, on this Sunday, we are continuing our United series where we talk about some of the things of our faith that unite us, uh, to borrow from one of the old affirmations of faith in our hymnal, even as the world seeks to divide us. Uh, and today we'll be talking about how uh, our faith transcends so many of the divisions that we seek to make in our world uh, and brings us together in the love of a God who loves us no matter what's going on around us. I hope you'll find it to be uh, an engaging and uplifting way to hear God's call on all of our lives. Uh, there's a couple links on the screen with me right now if you're worshiping with us online. The first one is for you. We believe that worship connects us with God and with each other. We want to celebrate that connection with you this morning. So if you're worshiping digitally, virtually, wherever you might be, uh, follow that link and sign in for us. If you're in person, hopefully you signed in on one of the tablets on your way in. Uh, if you're a visitor with us, that second link there has a link to the visitor sign in. It's also, there are cards in the pew backs that have QR codes where you can fill them out and drop them in the baskets. We celebrate your presence with us. We know there's a lot of things you can do on a Sunday morning, and we're grateful that uh, you are choosing to be here to worship God with us at St. Stephen's, and we'd love to connect with you in that way. That bulletin link also takes you to a digital bulletin. We have a handful of paper ones in the back, and as I say every week, everything you need to participate in worship this morning will be on screen, but if you're like me and you like to read ahead or see the announcements and stuff like that, that digital bulletin has all the info you'd ever want and more. Uh, in just a few minutes, or in just a second, rather, uh, we'll have a prelude, our acolytes will light the candles. I invite you to take that time and center yourself and prepare for worship. Maybe uh, say a silent prayer, take a few deep breaths, wave to those around you as a way of passing the peace, send an encouraging note to someone as a way of passing the peace even beyond this space. Let's worship God together.
Please join me now in the call to worship. I exalt you, Lord, because you pulled me up. You didn't let my enemies celebrate over me. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. God's anger lasts for only a season, second, but God's favor lasts a lifetime. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Weeping may stay all night, but my morning joy. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. You changed my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and dressed me up in joy so that my whole being might sing praises to you and never stop. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. I am not Emilio Vasquez. Um, Emilio, unfortunately, had an emergency at the last second and was unable to attend today. My name is Sean Holzhauser, and I am honored to get to lead the vocal music today for all of you. Uh, if you can turn your hymnals to page 698, God of the Ages. Fresh, my people, 
You may be seated. Our scripture today is the story of Naaman from 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. Naaman, a general for the king of Aram, was a great man and highly regarded by his master because through him the Lord had taken victory to Aram. This man was a mighty warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now Aramean raiding parties had gone out and captured a young girl from the land of Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master could come before the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his master what the young girl from the land of Israel had said. Then Aram's king said, Go ahead, I will send a letter to Israel's king. So Naaman left. He took along two kikars of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. He brought the letter to Israel's king, and it read, Along with this letter, I'm sending you my servant Naaman, so you can cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his clothes. He said, What? Am I a god to hand out death and life? But this king writes me, asking me to cure someone of his skin disease. You must realize that he wants to start a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard what Israel's king had ripped his clothes, he sent word to the king. Why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. Then he'll know that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent out a messenger who said, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and become clean. But Naaman went away in anger. He said, I thought for sure he'd come out, stand and call the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the bad spot and cure the skin disease. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Yavana, and the far, far better than all of Israel's waters? Couldn't I just wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. Naaman's servants came to him and spoke to him. Our father, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was, wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan River seven times, just as the man of God had said. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. Let us sing the chorus from hymn number 454, Open My Eyes That I May See. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God that I will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Please join me now in the prayers of the people. Together, let us pray. For every person without exception, to know that each of us is a beloved child of God. For reminders each day that the church is yours, God, and not ours. For the knowledge that you, God, are in our neighborhoods, workplaces, and homes, as well as in our church. For the privilege of worshiping you, God, and how it connects us all. For the stories from scripture that transform our own stories, bringing hope, peace, joy, love, and light. Hear our prayers as we pray in silence.
And now we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, each the way we first learned it, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, our gospel reading this morning is out of the 10th chapter of the gospel according to Luke. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible translation. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit for the reading of the gospel. After these things, the Lord commissioned 72 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every city and place he was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. Go, be warned though that I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves, carry no wallet, no bag, and no sandals. Don't even greet anyone along the way. Whenever you enter a house, first say, may peace be upon this house. If anyone there shares God's peace, then your peace will rest on that person. If not, your blessing will return to you. Remain in this house, eating and drinking whatever they set before you, for workers deserve their pay. Don't move from house to house, Whenever you enter a city and its people welcome you, eat what they set before you. Heal the sick who are there and say to them, God's kingdom has come upon you. Whenever you enter a city and the people don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say, as a complaint against you, we brush off the dust of your city that is collected on our feet. But know this, God's kingdom has come to you. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The 72 returned joyously, saying, Lord, even the demons submit themselves to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority to crush snakes and scorpions underfoot. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice because the spirits submit to you. Rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. Friends, these are inspired words for beloved people. Lord, transform us through its hearing. You may be seated. So there's enough names and action in the first passage of Scripture out of Second Kings that Dan read for us this morning that I think it it's worth unpacking a little bit what's going on here. So uh, if we want to really simplify the story, Naaman is not a good guy in the eyes of the people who are hearing this story. He is instead a mighty warrior and general for one of the many opposing kingdoms to the kingdoms of Israel and Judah over the course of the time that God's people were perpetually in and out of these different political alliances and different invading armies come in and do whatever else in the area. And when there is peace, it's based on treaties that are often short-lived and only as good as uh, waiting on the next cycle of weather when someone needs access to a port or better fresh water or some new farmland or whatever the case may be. And so Naaman uh, is a very significant threat to the people he encounters throughout this narrative. Um, He's also obviously really, really, really sick and hurting and scared and doing anything he can to save his own life, right? He travels with this enormous sum of money and all of these people, uh, and the king has sent him to do this with the king's blessing because Naaman is his best general, and he wants him to get well no matter what. And you have to wonder what that king had in the back of his head as his understanding of what's happening with these people, Israel, if he sends his best guy to try to be healed by their God. And so 
Naaman shows up at the king's house, and the king does what kings do and looks at this situation as a political situation and goes, well, there's no way for me to win here because either I heal the general of this threatening country that could at any time wipe us off the map and, you know, send him back to continue to do his leading of forces and battles that will eventually probably catch up with us, or I fail at doing that, and then I've made the ruler of that country mad that I mistreated or didn't save his great general, so then we're going to have a war on our hands anyways. There's nothing I can do about this, and the king did what people did when they were despondent in that time and place, and he rips his clothes and starts screaming, and Elisha hears about this and is like, hey, uh, have you tried just doing what he's asking? Send him to me, and we'll have God try and heal him. And the king, it doesn't say the king says, oh yeah, that's a good idea, but clearly he hasn't gotten any of his own. So he sends uh, Naaman along to Elisha, and Elisha tells him, go take a bath in the river over here and you'll be fine. And uh, Naaman, you know, thinks, you know, I emptied out my bank accounts. I am carrying all this gold and silver. I have all these people with me. I am a mighty warrior, and you're telling me all I have to do is rinse off in a river? The rivers are prettier where I live than here. This is ridiculous. How dare you waste my time like this? Um, the people that I trust would never ask something so beneath me of me in a situation like this. And Elisha is like, well, all right, man. I mean, I told you what to do, but whatever. And Naaman's uh, servants who are with him say, so if he'd asked you to do something really difficult to cure this leprosy, would you have done it? And Naaman goes, well, yeah, I I guess I would have. So you think maybe it's worth jumping in that river over there and seeing if doing something really simple might actually be all you need to do to get better? And Naaman sheepishly agrees and goes under the water and comes out and his leprosy has been cured. Uh, And he claims that this God of Israel must be the greatest of all beings and greater than any God that his people might worship. And what do you know? He is cured by just doing what somebody that he didn't trust because of political allegiances and alliances said and everything is made better. Um, It's a great story because there's so many different ways we can find ourselves in the midst of it, whether we see ourselves as distrustful leaders who are always trying to make sure that our people are protected from outside forces, or we see ourselves as the people who just don't trust anything anybody has to say, or we're a king type, and we always see the potential ramifications of our simple actions and how they might come back and bite us, or we're occasionally able to rise to the level of a prophet and point people towards simple solutions to what they find to be overwhelmingly complex problems. There's all kinds of lessons we can pull out of this story on how it is we might come to trust God even when things are difficult. Uh, And there are lessons that are obviously very difficult for people to absorb uh, because we're not good at listening to each other in our society pretty much anywhere. Um, And part of how I know this is I can read the news. Um, And I feel like in the last 10 days or so, um, independent of whether um, your personal beliefs and views have been upheld and expanded or shot down by the Supreme Court and other political actions in our society, we have seen people make no attempts to make meaningful connection or talk to anybody who doesn't already agree with their perspective as we see how we try and move through everything in front of us and people are not behaving well. And I think, um, and I'll get to the second scripture passage and the good news in this in a minute, the root of this um, stems from the fact that for most of us in how we live our lives, we are much more loyal to a political ideology or a worldview or a group that we find ourselves to be a part of than we are to God and we are to each other. Um, And so, our mo- meaning and decisions are made for us before difficult questions, and we never stop to think about stuff. And these are questions 
that are big and complicated issues to talk about and think about. And um, we're so certain that there's a simple, easy answer to everything, but it might surprise some of you to know uh, that deeply faithful Christians have disagreed about when life might begin as long as human beings have had any ability to control when life might begin. Uh, And that even two groups of religious people much older than the Methodist Church, the Roman Catholic Church and uh, our Jewish siblings in the faith, have read the same Old Testament and come to polar opposite understandings of how we ought to consider uh, human life's beginning, whether it happens at some time before birth or at birth itself. And so all of this is complicated and nuanced and requires deep and meaningful conversations, but that's not how we get clicks on websites or easy votes in our political system. So instead, we're always pushed. You got to believe exactly this or exactly this, and there's no room for anybody to have any nuance. And you join that team and you cheer for that team, and that's how we're going to make these decisions. Um, I'd encourage you to look up what the beliefs of the United Methodist Church are about uh, access to women's health care and reproductive care. Uh, You might be surprised that regardless of your perspective, some of it makes you go, yeah, that's exactly what I believe. And some of it makes you go, huh, I haven't thought about that that way. Anyhow, And we're also a nation deeply divided on how we consider what it is to be a responsible gun owner and what rules we ought to have about that. And that showed up. And it's just everything is so entrenched in us that our team believes this, so we believe this, or our team believes this, that that we can't even talk to each other anymore. And I say that a lot in here. But I say it a lot in here because uh, it brings me a lot of hope, having been here for this is the start of my sixth year here at St. Stephen's, to know enough of you well enough to know that this room of people never agrees about anything. Uh, That there are people on every side of every major, significant, cultural and political and social issue who sit in these pews and love Jesus with all their hearts and want desperately to be a church. And that is the call of the gospel. Uh, That it's not to hear a preacher that I always agree with or to go to a church that exactly matches this, this, and this that I believe, but to be in community with people who want their lives to be lives connected to loving Jesus and loving their neighbors and to work on the other stuff together, even when we don't agree about it. And part of how I know this church is so good about this is because I wasn't here for 10 days recently. Uh, Let me explain a little bit. So um, some of you who have been coming for a while know that just over a year ago, uh, Sarah and I went to the UK to visit her grandmother who had a terminal cancer diagnosis. Uh, And I can admit to you, I think and keep composure that at the end of that trip, while Sarah and her grandmother were sitting together at the dinner table as we were about to leave for the airport, I could not keep it together uh, because I knew what our next trip back to the UK would be. And it's the trip we just took uh, where we celebrated her grandmother's life and got to spread her ashes in this beautiful place where her family uh, has been spreading uh, the ashes of loved ones for many, many years. And it was a wonderful trip, and we saw family, and we celebrated Angela's life, and we celebrated her sister's 80th birthday delayed because of the pandemic, and that was one of those things that was beautiful and sweet and bittersweet because Angela and her sister, Adria, had plans to share that celebration of 80th birthdays together, but uh, because of Angela's passing and the pandemic, that never happened. Uh, And so we're coordinating all of these schedules of people in the UK and people over here and Um, Sarah's sister has three small children, two of whom are in school, and so figuring out dates that might work, and we throw around a dozen different possible times to go, and the one time that works runs through the first half of Vacation Bible School here. And I'm like, well, I feel like I should be at Vacation Bible School, but I certainly can't miss something this significant for my family And I felt sick to my stomach about the idea because I have an overinflated sense of importance and thought, how could a church possibly have a successful vacation Bible school without the senior pastor being there to help with stuff? Uh, What will they do when they have to answer questions on their own? Um, And the answer is throw what most of the families who have been coming for years called the best vacation Bible school we've had in a long, long time. 
Um, so I, I got back Wednesday of the week and was able to be here on Thursday and Friday during the day, be at the Thursday family celebration where we had great turnout from the folks who drug, the kids who drug their parents in here to sing the songs with them and then go down the hall and meet all of the wonderful people in the Bible village and their classrooms and stuff and celebrate all of that. And, and, you know, Stephen, of course, did a great job organizing everyone, and we had so many wonderful volunteers, many of them church members, many of them community members that just love our Vacation Bible School. Um, the Bible Village for, you know, 20 plus years now has been this really cool mix of uh, some of our older adults and teenage helpers who maybe only come to this church for that every single summer and do an incredible job loving these elementary school kids. We had a hundred and some odd kids in here every day. It was just awesome. And it was because even if we can't always do it in the rest of our lives, when this church puts its mind to remembering that the most important thing is for us to love Jesus and to show people that Jesus loves them, we can do incredible things, no matter who is or isn't here to help lead the way. And I know that's true because of things like Vacation Bible School. I know that's true because we're still here and doing meaningful ministry after all of these funerals that I've done in the last five years of some of the people who we knew we couldn't function without, um, that people step up and help people to experience Jesus. And so um, in the King's story under this old covenant, Everybody was really scared of how what might what their interactions might do to break down and have everybody go back into these divisions and cause geopolitical nightmares and problems because people didn't know how to get along and trust and love each other. Uh, in the gospel story, we see Jesus show us that this need to divide ourselves and to break away and to be such a segregated society is totally at odds with what we're trying to do in the gospel world. And so he puts together teams of two, uh, 72 people's worth, and in, when you look closer into the, the language involved in this and the Greek and whatnot, it's pretty clear that these were teams that had men and women on them. And he sends them out to be fixers in towns around the land because what they're trying to do is too big for just him or even him and the 12 disciples to take care of. And they're to go out and to preach to people, if you love God, let me tell you about Jesus and how he's helping us to follow this God that you love. And they're just spreading like wildfire. And then he tells them, and when you do that, ask people around you if they want to share the same kind of news too. And I know it worked because we're here. Because out of this movement that Jesus started, eventually the faith crossed the boundary from the Jewish world into the Gentile world. Eventually the faith crossed the boundary from the Roman Empire into the rest of the West and into Africa and into Asia. And then all over the world, people learned that following Jesus could bring together people who couldn't figure out how they would ever live together. Um, so the good news for us is that we are united by a God who tells us how much each of us matters and that that is so much more important than any divisions or identities we might find in this world, that the things that matter are completely out of step with what the world tells you is what matters and that that is the best news of all. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, first Sunday of the month means we have a mission focus, and we try and highlight one of the different meaningful ways our church is helping people to experience the love of Christ in their lives. Uh, David and Marsha Massey are going to come up and talk to us about this month's mission focus, which is Kairos Outside, a really cool ministry uh, to some really vulnerable people who really need to experience a place of love and welcome, uh, and they're going to let you know what it is and how we can help support it. So. Thank you, Pastor. We appreciate the chance to present this to the church. A couple of symbols. I'm, I am in the symbol, you may have noticed. <laughs> a couple of symbols I'd like to point out. We each wear crosses around our neck. These crosses were presented by the entire team. They were prayed over. Hands were laid on this. Hands were laid on us. 
for the simple mission that we could present the message of love of the Lord Jesus Christ to these ladies. You'll see the symbol on the screen behind me. It shows a male and a female outline because these ladies suffer just as intensely and just as deep as their male who is incarcerated. They're in prison too. They're imprisoned by our society. The last thing I want to say, and I think the most important thing I want to do, Marsh has put some brochures in the back about Carlos Outside. This is a testimony from a Carlos Outside guest. I was shown unconditional love. I was told God just wanted to be my friend, and I wanted so very much to have a friend. I clung to that simple concept like a drowning woman. This was the beginning of the journey to where I am today, and that was written by one of the guests for a weekend. It takes almost $8,000 to put on one of these weekends. The ladies pay nothing. We show them love, and we make them know that they're not the only ones going through this. And some of these women, when they first get there, they're really afraid, and they're but the time the weekend is over, there is so much joy in these women. It's just an amazing ministry for these women who have somebody incarcerated. And we need all the donations we can to put on these weekends for these ladies. So if you could, we really would appreciate a donation. Thank you. Thank you, St. Stephen's family. Thank you all. So... To anything you mark communion this month uh, will help support the ministry of Kairos Outside, which, uh, as David and, and Marcia just shared, uh, supports the families of incarcerated people through uh, a weekend retreat where they're reminded that there are people that love and support them uh, as they deal with the, you know, the social pressures and condemnation with trying to be single parents with all of the things that come uh, with a family separated by incarceration. It's really a wonderful ministry. And if I think that later this month there will be a, a bake sale to also raise some funds to help support Kairos Outside. So be on the lookout for a way to uh, buy really delicious baked goods in support of a good cause. Uh, I'm thankful to pastor a church that loves its neighbors well, that seeks ways to connect people with God's love, uh, even people that uh, the world is so good at shutting out of God's love, or of their love at least. Um, as you uh, celebrate uh, during this offertory music, I invite you to give and to give generously in support of our church. Image together. Why do the people imagine a vain thing? Why do the nations rage so furiously together? Why do the people imagine? Furiously rage together, and why to the people, and why to the people imagine a vain thing? Why do the nations rage? So furiously together, so furiously together. And why do the people imagine a vain thing? Imagine a vain thing. And why do the people imagine a vain thing? 
frente The kings of the earth rise up And the rulers take counsel together Take counsel Take counsel together Against the Lord and against his Against the Lord and his anointed. Amen. I uh, was going to do this during announcements, but I wanted to say a special thank you to Sean for helping lead us in music today. Uh, it's just been wonderful, and we'll hear more later. But And also to uh, Dr. Andrea Moots for perpetually using her wonderful connections in the Houston music community to bless us with such wonderful music. So with a last-minute change in singers, this is what a wonderful service we get. So thank you to both of you for a great day. And now, as we enter into a time of communion, uh, I invite you to uh, join me in this moment of confession when we admit to falling short of who God has called us to be. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. So those of you who have not taken communion with us here in a while, we like to do a sung communion liturgy. Uh, I'll uh, have Sean help me with some of the leadership parts. Your parts are pretty simple. You'll catch on, I bet. Uh, Sing out and sing loud as we do this together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is to give our thanks and praise. It is right, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. 
Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from a slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Uh, as those assisting with communion come forward, a few instructions. So in the United Methodist Church and here at St. Stephen's, we practice what is called an open communion table, which means that you are invited to come to this table whether or not you're a member of this church. Uh, if you earnestly want to receive this gift from God, you can come and do so here. And we do everything we can to try and reduce the barriers to that um, ability to come and receive this gift from God here at St. Stephen's. So if you're worshiping with us online and you have something like bread and grape juice at home, take it with us and remember that they are the body and blood of Christ given for you. Uh, if you have uh, gluten allergies or aren't ready to come through a line and share bread and a cup with folks in this age of increased awareness about germs, we have these little cups here uh, that are pre-filled and sealed. The wafer is gluten-free, uh, and it's grape juice and a wafer. Our ushers also have those for folks that can't move up. If you want to grab one of these, you can take communion that way. Or as they release you by row, you can come and receive uh, the bread and the cup, or even if you want just the bread uh, from one of our servers. We have our servers wear masks uh, just as a way to ensure that everyone who wants to come up feels comfortable doing that. We've got hand sanitizer we'll give to folks that need that. Uh, again, we really do want to do everything we can to practice an open communion table where everyone feels welcome to come and receive. So in just a second, we're going to serve our servers and have them come down, uh, and the table is ready. So come at the usher's instruction.
Thanks be to God for this holy mystery. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the service, this week was Vacation Bible School here, uh, and our first announcement as we prepare to conclude our service is actually a video celebration of what all happened around here over the last week. Yeah, so as you can tell, no one had any fun at all uh, last week. Uh, it was really a wonderful experience for so many folks. Uh, my only other announcements are uh, we're continuing to accept donations for our UM Army trip that's coming up. Uh, so next Sunday, I will be in worship in Crockett because I'm directing our camp, so I'll be there to say hi to those people who are letting us take over their building for the week. Um, and we're taking like 20-something people from here at St. Stephen's. Our whole camp has over 100 people, and it's going to be a great week in Crockett, so hold that in your prayers. Uh, and then this, I'll keep this brief because then we're already at noon, but um, starting on August 21st, our schedule is going to be a little bit different. We think this will help us to engage with some of the families in our neighborhood better and allow us to try a few new things. So traditional worship in this room, the way it has been happening lately, will be at 1030 on Sunday mornings starting August 21st. Uh, and that'll give us a leg up on getting to the best brunch and lunch places ahead of the crowds, which nobody's sad about. Uh, those of you who are sports fans will never have to miss the first pitch or kickoff, and you can come and stay through the whole church service. So all that should be really good. Uh, and also, starting that August 21st as a preview, and then going forward on second Sundays through the fall, we're going to try a family worship experience uh, in the fellowship hall 
at 9.15. That'll be, so we'll serve community breakfast on those Sundays. We'll have a couple of elements for messy church around the edges of the room to incorporate some contemporary music, a real informal and friendly service that uh, is totally welcoming to all different age and sorts of worshipers, uh, and hope that that'll really be good. There's a sign-up page online now if you want to help us get that off the ground. We're looking for people to help make breakfast, for people to help greet, and all of those things. So uh, talk to me more if you're interested in learning about that service starting this fall. Uh, those are all the announcements I have. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit uh, as we sing our closing hymn. Uh, is it possible for us to sing just one verse of the closing hymn since we've run over on time? Great. Faith of our fathers living still In spite of dungeon fire and sword Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy Whene'er we hear that glorious word Faith of our fathers holy faith we will be true to thee till death we are united by a God who loves us no matter who we vote for, who we cheer for in our favorite sporting events, who our friends are, who we have a hard time liking or loving, and that God calls us to see every single person we encounter as another beloved child of God. So as you go from this place, I invite you to do what you can to see everyone as someone God loves as much as God loves you, even the people who drive you nuts. As you go from this place, let's try and do that. Amen.